Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, let me put my coffee down. It's, it's uh, wonderful to be here uh, at your university. It's my first trip to Utah, uh, which everyone has told me uh, many times that I needed to get over here, how beautiful it is, and they were not lying. Uh, and it's an honor to spend time at this institution that I've been learning about this morning and all the wonderful programs that you're doing. I must say, I've, I spent I've been at many universities and I've, I've spoken in different places and it's rare to actually spend time on the issue of ethics uh, at the undergraduate level, which says more about uh, our society uh, than about anything else. I think it's really urgent at this moment in our history that we think about these problems and we think about what ethics entail and how you reach these kinds of decisions and what kinds of debates we're even talking about when we uh, call for a, a more rigorous ethical approach to our public problems. So it's really wonderful to hear about the events that you're having. I'll thank uh, Brian for helping put all this together. All these events uh, for, for all the students are really difficult uh, to get into place. There's a lot of good ideas at universities that don't often go anywhere. Uh, so I'm always very appreciative when things come together. And, and thanks to everyone, really who made this happen. This is one of those talks, and all my talks these days are like this, where I'm a little weary to write too much ahead of time. Uh, you know, five, six years ago when I would give a talk, I'd be happy to write the talk six months in advance, three months in advance. But these days, because of how things are unfolding uh, on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis, or just on my airplane trip here from New York yesterday, in the time of my travel, two major news stories seem to be exploding and unfolding uh, by the time that I landed. I think it says a lot uh, that even in thinking about remarks like these, I really can't finalize them until right now uh, when I'm standing before you. And I think this is actually one of the challenges that we are facing in our politics today. In any case, uh, thanks for having me and, and I'll talk for a while and then I hope I can take questions and answers. I love to interact with all of you about what's, what's on your mind. The erosion of truth in uh, American politics, in our democracy, has been one of the most striking developments of what's been going on over the past few decades. Fact checkers have now become a cottage industry. While fact checkers used to be something that you would find within a newspaper or a television station, uh, or within a magazine through much of the 20th century to check what reporters had written. Time Magazine, I mean, uh, Harvard uh, uh, historian Jill Lepore has a new book, and she writes Time Magazine, when it was created in 1923, was originally going to be called Facts uh, before they changed the name of a magazine, which showed a, a kind of commitment to the value of the truth early on. But what we've seen since the 1990s and the early 2000s is this proliferation of organizations, websites, and journalists whose entire operation revolves around trying to figure out what's true and what's not true. Checking the words of politician, listing how many times someone has lied, giving Pinocchios uh, based on what someone has said, and really trying to help us sort out all of the noise that we see. And to me, the prevalence of these organizations, it, obviously it's good, and it's good to have all of them out there, but it also seems to me a sign that something's wrong. When we need as a society so many sources to tell us what's true and what's not true, we might have a problem on our hands. It signals that the truth has really lost some of its standing in the public square. And of course, the problem is even worse since so many of those fact-checking organizations now are partisan themselves and can't even be trusted all the time. While there's been a burst of fact-checking organizations and individuals, it's not clear that it's working. With more and more people looking to make sure that we get the stories right or that politicians are honest about what they're telling us, we live in a political world where it is increasingly difficult to tell the difference between fact and fiction. There was a cartoon in the magazine The New Yorker depicting a Jeopardy-like game show called Facts Don't Matter. 
Looking at the panel of three contestants, the host says, I'm sorry, Jeannie, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours, so he gets the points. In our partisan world, facts have become weaponized, like almost everything else. As one political scientist wrote in the New York Times following the passage of Brexit, the sense is widespread. We have entered in an age of post-truth politics. As politics becomes more dominated by television performances, the status of facts in public debates rises too. We place expectations, expectations on statistics and expert testimony that strains them to the breaking point. Rather than sit coolly outside the fray of political argument, however, facts are now one of the main rhetorical weapons within it. How can we still be speaking of facts when they no longer provide us with the reality that we can all agree on? The problem, he said, is that experts and agencies involved in producing facts have multiplied, and many are now for hire. If you really want to find an expert on something willing to endorse a fact, and you have sufficient money or political clout to do it, you probably can. And then we get to the presidency. Most presidents, as the nation's Eric Alterman argued in a classic book on the subject published many years ago, lie. They say things that are not true. This is not new to presidential history. Indeed, Alterman reminds us that we often tend to underestimate or sometimes simply ignore how, quote, presidential lies have shaped some of our biggest developments in post-war history. They're small lies and they're big lies. My last book, as you heard, was on Lyndon Johnson, who in August of 1964 argued and told the public that there had been an attack in the Gulf of Tonkin near Vietnam, and even though he knew that attack probably didn't happen the way he was saying it, used that to justify going to Congress and asking for a massive expansion of military authority so that he could send troops to Vietnam. And that was called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and it's a pivotal moment in the escalation of that tragic war. The fact that the Vietnam War was begun with a lie, Alterman wrote, would end up tainting the entire conflict in the eyes of U.S. citizens once that falsehood was cover uncovered. But even with lies of that scale and scope, I think it's fair to say that we've seen something different under President Trump. In short, he says things that are not true all the time. He tells things uh, to the public without any sense of shame or embarrassment. Early in his presidency, he regularly would boast that he won the popular vote against Hillary Clinton, which he did not. Or he would say that there is evidence of massive voting fraud, which almost every serious study has confirmed did not happen. He's taken conspiracy theories and tweeted them out as fact, while he has thrown political mud on the wall almost every day based on very little. He's pushed the boundaries of our political environment by ignoring the truth without any sense of restraint. On August 1st, the Washington Post, a newspaper he doesn't like, reported that the president had made 4,200 and 29 false or misleading claims in the span of 558 days. And whether you support him or don't like him, that's a pretty impressive feat. Whoever is careless with the truth in small matters cannot be trusted with important matters, Albert Einstein once said. The issue, though, is not simply how President Trump lies or doesn't lie, but why it has not been more devastating politically. Like so much else of the Trump presidency, he is as much a product 
of our times as a cause of it. And this is a way of thinking about what's been going on since January 2017 that I think is really quite essential. This is a big question about Trumpism, if we call it that, including the erosion of truth in the public square. Why are some things that we're seeing permissible? Why are some of the most outlandish parts of the presidency normalized at some level in our political culture? The big news organizations said Tony Blair's former press secretary, Alistair Campbell, haven't really thought through how to deal with the new phenomenon of having world leaders who don't even have to feel that they have to apologize for blatant lies. And I'm coming here to speak to you at a really crucial moment, I think, in what some of the effects of this will be. Many years ago, back in 1991, uh, all of us here who lived through that, not the students, but many of the rest of us, watched how the Senate handled allegations that emerged when Supreme Court uh, nominee uh, Clarence Thomas had been appointed by President George H.W. Bush. And at the very end of the hearings, right before a vote was about to happen, a reporter for NPR broke a story that Anita Hill, who had worked with Clarence Thomas at the EEOC earlier in their career, had sexually harassed her. At the time, there were many critics of how the Senate Judiciary Committee handled this, including the Democrats and the Republicans, including Senator Joe Biden, that they didn't take the accusation seriously enough. And that when she appeared before the committee, they ended up asking her more questions about her life than they did about Thomas and the accusations that had been raised. And today, this week, this Thursday, we face a similar situation where Dr. Christine Blasey Ford is going to testify about allegations she has made about Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh that he was part of a group of boys in high school who sexually assaulted her. The president, after a few days of restraint, unleashed a series of tweets and statements saying this was not true. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has been very clear and direct that the Republicans intend to roll over this or move through this to get the confirmation in place. And some parts of the media have been filled with conspiracy, false claims, and insinuations of her. In this case, the question will be, is there even an effort to figure out the veracity of these claims? There are many who are suspicious this will really happen. Unlike with Anita Hill, this time there won't even be any kind of FBI investigation. There will be no independent evaluation of what has been said. It will be a he said, she said situation where most likely each party will make a determination based on what they see or what they want and go their own way. But the way that the Senate this week handles how do you get at the truth of something this important and this significant will tell us a lot about where the truth stands and how it's evaluated in Washington. So what explains the diminished standing of the truth in politics if we move beyond only looking at President Trump or any political leader you think is responsible? The first big factor that I think you need to consider has to do that we still live in the shadow of Watergate. Watergate was the scandal which in 1974 brought down President Richard Nixon, who resigned in the middle of his second term. And for all the students, imagine, if you wonder kind of what that was like, imagine the trauma of literally watching a president say, I'm done, realizing he's about to be impeached and taking off and his vice president, Gerald Ford, took over. That Watergate scandal, combined with the impact of the Vietnam War, shattered public faith in almost every institution we have. And I believe that is at the root of some of what we're seeing today. 
The number of Americans who said that they trusted the federal government to do the right thing nearly all the time has continued steadily to plummet since 1964, when that number was 77%. It had fallen within one decade by 1974 at the climactic moment of Watergate by one half, and it fell by under a quarter by the end of the 1970s. I'm not sure what that number is right now, but I'm sure it's extraordinarily low. Every major political institution, according to the polls, has seen this decline in public trust. The presidency suffered enormously from the moment that Nixon stepped down and from the moment that Congress had exposed the kinds of activities that had taken place in the Oval Office. But the presidency was not the only institution to suffer. Every part of our political system went through this as well. Though Congress enjoyed a burst of support in the mid-1970s when they helped to bring down the president, since that time, public trust in Congress has continued to plummet. Today, according to most polls, legislators receive the same level of trust, if not less trust, than car salesmen or lawyers, both of whom usually register pretty low in these surveys. The news, an important institution uh, in terms of helping us understand what's going on, has also seen its public support fall steadily since the 1980s, which is something that President Trump has systematically tried to capitalize on since entering the office with his attacks on fake news. Though we often love to discuss the way in which two reporters from the Washington Post, Woodward and Bernstein, inspired a whole generation of young Americans to enter into journalism because of the way that they covered Watergate, the truth is that the news media has not really fared much better in surveys of what people think of what they see. As a result of this, we've lost a key source of authority who could help provide us as citizens a guide in terms of understanding what to believe. In September 2016, while President Obama was in office, not President Trump, Gallup reported that only 32% of those polled had strong trust in what the media told them. The same poll found that 74% of Americans believed that news organizations favored one side of the political spectrum, including the same people who still believed that the media served as the best watchdog that we had to prevent leaders from doing what they shouldn't be doing. So the press, even while being revered as a watchdog, was slanted in the eyes of many Americans. With less trust in the mainstream news media, the fake news media, as President Trump calls it, or the lamestream media, as Republican vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin called it back in 2008, other voices who make claims about politics and society have more space to run freely. The context of distrust in institutions is one of the reasons that fringe elements have more capacity to gain a hearing on public matters. It is not even that there are more outlets publishing fake stories and putting out false information, but it's that the authority of those who are working in conventional outlets don't have the same ability to push back on that kind of information. They don't have the same grip on the national psyche that they once had. There are no more Walter Cronkites as there was in 1968 on CBS News to convince Americans that the war in Vietnam was going poorly. Today, distrust is spread pretty evenly, and as a result, Ironically, uh, the amount of fake news only continues to multiply. Equally important as the erosion of trust in news as an institution has been the decline 
in trust of expertise. There was a period in American history, for those of you who are taking some history courses, beginning in the progressive era, the turn of the 20th century, going through the Cold War in the 1950s, when expertise was a valued commodity in American life. The government poured massive amounts of money into universities and into scientific research. The expert was a respected voice throughout the country. We turned on to experts to help us understand medicine and science. We looked to psychiatrists to help us understand what was going on with the mind. We asked social scientists to help devise better government policy and better social programs. Experts could be found in pop culture, on television shows, in movies, and in fictional books in heroic fashion. And many young people such as yourself aspire to acquire specialized knowledge and to become expert in a subject matter for the rest of their career. The historian Brian Ballow wrote a terrific book about the Cold War where he argued one of the things we saw in Washington was the creation of the pro-ministrative state. That's just jargon. But what it meant was a, an alliance, a marriage between the administrators and government bureaucracies and the experts from the universities. And after the Manhattan Project uh, that brought, helped bring an end to World War II, there was immense faith in Washington that expertise should be a central part of how Washington worked. In Congress, the number of staff on Capitol Hill, for example, proliferated. But all of that suffered since the 1960s with this same phenomenon of distrust. On the left, many believed that expertise was simply a tool for people to control a lot of what society did. They challenged experts who used their authority to achieve power over marginalized populations. Propaganda all is phony, Bob Dylan sang at the top of his lungs in a 1974 rendition of the song It's All Right Ma on a live album with the band. In the humanities, theories of relativity started to gain hold where philosophers, historians, literary critics, and others rejected the notion that there could ever be something that could be called the truth. Every fact was seen through the prism of a person's belief and bias. Nothing was objective. The right also dismissed expertise after the 1960s. They didn't trust it anymore. They argued that the experts, the facts that they promoted, simply represented a liberal worldview. Universities were dismissed as one-sided and slanted arenas where conservatives could not find space. The war on expertise had a big impact from the right in many areas of, of policy, including climate change. Since the 1980s, as this example, the conservative attack on regulations to try to deal with climate change have centered as much on questioning the idea of whether of the scientific consensus about this issue as it has on the legitimacy or efficacy as, of regulation as a solution to this problem. The historian David Greenberg wrote a great essay about this during the years of the George W. Bush presidency. And the efforts have worked. Some of this distrust from both sides does stem from a healthy skepticism about those who tell us what's right and wrong, but much of it also comes from a dangerous disbelief, a kind of nihilism, that anything is true. As Tom Nichols, a professor at the US Navy War College, wrote in his book, The Death of Expertise, Witnessing, we are witnessing the death of the ideal of expertise itself, a Google-fueled, Wikipedia-based, blog-sodden collapse of any division between professionals and laypeople, students and teachers, knowers and wonders. In other words, between those of any achievement in an arena or an area and those with none at all. To demonstrate the effects, he cited a 2014 poll in the Washington Post following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where the poll found that 
uh, an overwhelming majority supported a forceful response to what Russia had done, but only one out of six of those polled had any idea where Ukraine actually was on the map. President Obama often said that one of the challenges his administration faced in climate change was that an individual who didn't believe in climate change and posted something on Facebook was indistinguishable from a Nobel Prize winning scientist who posted something on his Facebook page that the two look the same in our modern world. So we trust institutions less and less. There are fewer people, fewer institutions, fewer ideas that the public believes as being trustworthy enough to count on. Another factor, a second factor behind the erosion of truth has to do with the impact of political polarization in our democracy, something I'm sure all of you have read about, heard about, or at least thought about. The distance between Democrats and Republicans, the distance between liberals and conservatives has kept growing in dramatic fashion since the 1970s. The center no longer holds in American politics. There were many reasons why polarization has happened since the 1970s that people, including myself, have written about. Uh, within Congress, for example, during the 1970s, reformers changed the way that Congress worked because they wanted to end the backroom bipartisan deal-making that had often happened in much of the 20th century, and they wanted to create a more partisan kind of government where parties each stood for something, where parties wouldn't sell out by reaching agreements with the other side, and they changed the way the rules worked and the processes of government work to make it more partisan, and they were successful. Part of what we saw is each party became more homogeneous in its composition. In Congress, on Capitol Hill, in the House, in the Senate, se uh, Southern Democrats, who had kind of moved the party to the center until the 1970s, moved over to the Republican Party, and liberal Northeastern Republicans, such as Jacob Javits of New York, basically disappeared from the GOP. The Republicans, which had been a party like the Democrats that mixed different ideas, that mixed different regions, all of this came to an end, and each party looked very red, or each the other party looked very blue. The congressional system that had revolved around strong committee chairs until the 1970s, who gained their positions through authority and could do almost whatever they wanted, all ended because of reforms in the 1970s, such as weakening the power of committee chairs, opening up more of the political process to the public that undercut the power of bipartisanship. As party leaders gained more control over the members of their party, either with new tools like campaign finance, political action committee, or new rules, it was harder for any Democrat or Republican to vote against the leaders of their party because they would be punished in one way or another. There were also important demographic changes since the 1970s as voters started to sort themselves out and to live among people who thought very much the same way about politics. That's when we started to see the emergence of this red-blue map that is now quite famous. One study from the Brookings Institution found that the number of senators and representatives in the 1970s who could be identified as centrists based on their votes was about 30% of the House and Senate. By the 1990s, that number was 10%. And today, that number is well under 5%. And that's part of how someone like a, a Senator John McCain, to take a Republican example, by the end of his career, he's kind of uh, memorialized as a, a moderate voice in Washington, even though his voting record, if you look at it, is pretty conservative. He's a Reagan Republican through and through. But the party moved so much to the right that it pushed someone like McCain to the center, and, and Mitt Romney, who might be your senator, has faced some of this as well. 
The changes in institutions and democracy complemented important shifts uh, that took place in the party. Most scholars uh, believe that at least in the last 15, 20 years, the Republican Party has moved even further to the right than the Democrats have moved to the left. Uh, that process started back in the 1980s. I'm writing a book about it with the emergence of Newt Gingrich, a congressman from Georgia who started to shake up Capitol Hill and push his party to stick uh, to a rightward position. And then it really intensified around 2010 and then 2014 as Tea Party Republicans, now called the Freedom Caucus, became a much stronger force within the party and really were able to shape what the leadership did. For Gingrich and the Tea Party, who I argue are the inheritors of his legacy, politics was a hardball smart sport. They were willing to engage in much more confrontational styles of governing, much tougher forms of partisan warfare, and they were much less willing to allow members of their caucus to even consider the possibility of bipartisan compromise. During Obama's presidency, Democrats learned a lot of how much impact this could happen, such as in 2011, when House Republicans threatened to send the government and the nation into default simply over a dispute over federal spending. The Republicans held up an unprecedented number of judicial appointments and were willing to use tools like the filibuster with great frequency. Strong partisanship created an environment that overwhelms the way in which people evaluate their political leaders. The search for truth has been replaced by the search for partisan advantage. And one moment in recent history where I really think you could see this at work and how it affected the truth in politics was during George W. Bush's presidency, which, which I've also written about. His re-election victory in 2004 against John Kerry, I believe, was also a pretty significant moment, a watershed moment. In terms of this issue, truth and falsehood in politics, it was possible, certainly possible, that the revelation that Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction, which had been the basis of launching the war against them after 9-11, in another era could have been absolutely devastating to the incumbent administration. But that's not what happened. Despite all the revelations, despite all the controversy, that that basic fact was not true, in 2004, President Bush was able to secure re-election against Kerry, and he depended on a partisan firewall to make sure that the electorate didn't shift too much because of what had happened. So all of this helps explain a second factor, I think, of why trust has so much eroded in our public sphere. The impact has been very detrimental. In an era of partisan polarization, the public closes itself off into silos where it's harder to persuade each side of something that they believe to be true, while extremists who play to like-minded persons, irrespective of the veracity of their claims, gain standing. Telling the truth in 2018 means telling people what they want to hear. And this is the opening through which falsehood gains a strong foothold in government. The third cause has to do with changes in the news media. Changes in public policy, technology, and business have created since the late 1980s a more fragmented and partisan world of news information that plays into our partisan political system. While there have always been strong voices on the airwaves on the right and the left that push very political views. Talk radio is an example. There's a great book by a historian, Nicole Hemmer, that traces conservative talk radio back to the 1930s as opposed to more recent times. Things really changed in 1987. I think that was an important uh, year 
for the news media. Does anyone know what happened in 1987? Bonus points. Rush Limbaugh. Limbaugh. All right, he was already on the air. Good guess. But uh, the FCC abandoned something that had been called the Fairness Doctrine. This was a regulation adopted in 1949, and they basically said that if a radio show or then television show put on one political viewpoint, they then had to put on someone to respond and to represent the other political viewpoint. And while there were many stations and programs that always challenged that and sometimes broke the rules, it was a source of pressure on producers uh, and reporters not to simply go on the airways and just tell one side. In 1987, the FCC abandons the rule. President Reagan had not been a fan of this regulation. He believed it was unfair and unnecessary. And once that rule is gone, it became much easier for hosts on these shows to simply present the news from one perspective. So between 1987 and about 1992, this is when Rush Limbaugh really becomes a major force, but equally important all over the country, you see a proliferation of political talk radio shows at the local level. And one of the responses was that networks started to form in the 1990s that were pretty open about their political bias. In 1996, Fox News formed as a network, and although the network initially, if you watch old coverage, tried to present pretty straight news, gradually they became much more partisan in their presentation. Uh, take it or leave it, but according to political fact, 12% of things said on Fox News today were mostly false, 29% were false, and 9% were what they call pants on fire. Um, uh, one conservative media figure was quite honest in the Weekly Standard. He said, it's great to have your cake and eat it too. Criticize other people for not being objective. Be as subjective as you want. It's a great little racket. I'm glad we actually found it. And of course, liberals created networks of their own during the 1990s and early 2000s. MSNBC uh, has been the most successful version of this. Uh, talk radio liberals have gone through various incarnations that have not been as successful, although now there's serious progress, uh, which is a version of this. And this was simply, it was not simply a political decision, it was also a commercial decision. In addition to the FCC getting rid of the fairness doctrine, the news started to respond much more to commercial incentives, uh, and they were attracted but to programming that would draw large audiences. And in our current era since the 1990s, many audiences want news that reflects their pre-existing political uh, perspectives. And all of these policy and commercial changes were fueled by important technological changes. Another landmark I teach about in my class uh, at Princeton is 1980, June 1980 when CNN first goes on the air, June 1st. And it's important because at that moment, the traditional news cycle completely falls apart. Rather than just having a TV cycle where you have a nightly news show uh, in the late evening for about a half hour, which actually means 22 minutes without commercials, now you have a news cycle that is constant ongoing and which always needs to be filled. The internet, obviously, was another major technological development which started to break down the editorial barriers to the dissemination of information, something that has been accelerated by social media, where it's very easy, whoever you are, to quickly get information out instantaneously without much of an editorial filter. And the confusion of the information noise surrounds us, that surrounds us undercuts our ability to really discern what are the facts. We even kind of see this in a different way with quote unquote reality television, right? This is a kind of programming which really takes off in the 90s. Trivia, one of the first really big shows is, is um, Real World on MTV, uh, which helps to popularize this program. And, and in some ways, this should be an example of where people want more truth, not less. They just want to see things that are real. 
right? It seems to go against the narrative I'm telling. But even that isn't quite, as you know, what it seems. Whether we're watching an island of competitors go after each other, a sound studio filled with amateur performers singing, uh, or a house that's been totally wired to capture the daily life of 20-somethings, reality television, I think many people know, isn't actually real. Since the advent of the programming, there have been repeated moments where we see that reality television is staged. We watch believing that things are happening in real time when very often they're produced and choreographed and the actions of participants has been induced. Some reality television is literally scripted and manipulated. There's a fictional show, Unreal, some of you might have seen, which is a fictional show about reality television trying to show how it's all fake. As news becomes more partisan, as the news cycle becomes more instantaneous and less possible to control, and as the boundaries over what kind of coverage are legitimate disappear, it's harder for the public to have faith in anything that they see or they read. They see it as either partisan or made up. And the final factor, which I'll just come back to where I started, is President Trump. While the point of my talk and a lot of my scholarship recently is to get away from seeing him as the center of our political universe and as the cause of a lot of what's happening, it's equally vital to understand the impact that a leader can have. And it's not insignificant what we're watching. Like him or hate him, I think it is impossible to ignore this basic element of his governing style, the fact that he's willing to kind of confuse information and throw things out there that cannot be supported. He's taken this to a new level. He's done it with a kind of abandon and a lack of shame I haven't seen in recent presidential history. And he often does it, I think, in very sophisticated fashion as a way to direct the attention of the news, as a way to shape the conversations that the public is having about what's important and what's not. I do think his relationship with the truth is one place where the use of the term unprecedented might be fit fitting. And in some ways, in the same ways that a president's ideas and rhetoric can have lasting consequences on the public, so too can the norms they set. And I believe in this area, President Trump is successfully busting norms that have restrained previous presidents, and this will be enormously consequential. There are some figures who continue to have unyielding confidence in the power of truth to survive. Michelle Obama said, we learned about honesty and integrity, that the truth matters, that you don't take shortcuts or play by your own set of rules, she said, in her ongoing uh, effort to keep people high when others go low. Can we make things better? And that's where I want to end. Unfortunately, I don't have much to say on that last part, because part of what I'm saying is the problem is actually deep-rooted. I don't think a change in president will transform everything and get us back into a better place. I come from a school of thought, and I don't mean Princeton, where I see how any moment in politics really has to be understood by looking 30 or, four years, uh, 30 or 40 years backward. This has been building for decades, ever since Nixon stepped down. But at a minimum, we will have to deal with the problem of partisanship. We need to pay more attention to reforms that will actually help weaken some of the power of partisan polarization in Washington. How do we handle the construction of districts back in the states? How do the rules in Congress work? And how do we finance our campaigns? All of those are issues which are actually directly related to our ability to restore the place of truth. Other reforms will have to take place in news organizations who have the responsibility to lead rather than simply follow in creating programming and websites such as ProPublica that insist on upholding certain standards. Some of the changes will depend on the leaders of these organizations taking brave steps regardless of the financial cost rather than taking the easy step today of telling everyone what they want to hear.
Universities and high schools have to double down on civics. They have to start teaching about ethics, and they have to start introducing classes on news consumption. Just because something is broke in American life, it doesn't mean it can't be fixed. This is one of the best parts of teaching and writing about American history. Looking back at moments like the Progressive Era, or even like the 1970s, where reformers took real steps to try to make our institutions work better, to make our democratic institutions more effective and more, more whole. The changes are hard. They often involve political struggle, and they often extract high costs on careers. But in the long run, those are the people who go down in the history books. Until we reach that moment, I do believe we face risks. For many years, there was a strong belief that the truth was the key toward social progress. As Martin Luther King said, unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. Is that true anymore? Is he right? Is it even possible? Unlike some parts of our political system, the truth is not something that can easily be cast aside. Without prioritizing the truth, our politics empowers the demagogues who scare us and empowers the politicians who are capable of making grave mistakes. Thank you.